Hello, this is Father Simeon, and welcome to our week in review. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see a PowerPoint presentation as we go through this next week. <clears throat> Please excuse my voice today. We're going to talk about someone else's voice here very soon. So this is uh, September 30th, and we're going to talk about the next several days, see what's going on. So the first thing I want to talk about is St. Romanos the Melodist. And if you know someone who is named uh, Roman or Romanos, there is a good chance this is uh that person's patron saints especially if that person happens to be associated with someone who's a poet or a musician or is a, a poet or musician themselves <clears throat> so saint romanos was from syria uh, was a deacon in beirut uh, made his way to constantinople uh, he developed the kentakia hymn form which originally this was this long uh, it was a long poetic sermon. And today we only do the beginning, uh, like the, you know, the, the first few lines, the prologue of, of that uh, particular Kentuckian. Uh, you will hear the Kentuckian during the Divine Liturgy when the priest brings the gospel out for the little entrance and, and takes the gospel through uh, the holy doors then uh, troparia are sung for the day or the season uh, for the the patron saint of the church, and eventually uh, the the choir the chanters would get to uh, the Kentuckian to be sung. And the most well known Kentuckia Kentuckian that was uh, composed by Saint Romanos is the Kentuckian of the Nativity of Jesus Christ, the Christmas Kentuckian. <clears throat> so. Uh, there's a great story about St. Romanos in addition to his, his composing, and that is that he, he was a very pious, prayerful, humble person. And uh, he was a, a wonderful poet, hymnographer, but not a great singer. So he was in prayer in the church, and he fell asleep, and the Theotokos came to him in a dream, and gave him a scroll and told him to eat it. And he ate this scroll. And because of the, the sweetness of the scroll that he ate, he awoke from his dream. And when he sang, he sang with a different voice, his voice, but a more beautiful voice. And it was a miracle that everyone, everyone could hear. So uh, St. Romanos became not only a wonderful hymn writer, but really a beautiful singer, which is attributed to this miracle, uh, is his uh, voice being healed by the grace of God through the scroll that the Theotokos gave him. And the Christmas Kentuckian is, is this. Today the Virgin gives birth to the Transcendent One, and the earth offers a cave to the unapproachable one. Angels with shepherds glorify him, and wise men journey with the star, since for our sake the eternal God was born as a little child. Notice how the music brings together the story of salvation history and the deep theology of the church, the, the mystery of who God is in the Incarnation. So let's just continue to talk a little more about the ethos of, of Orthodox music. We don't sing a lot during morning prayer together. We sing um, the Lord have mercy is where the responses are sung. And uh, the Traparian of uh, St. Constantine, and, and we may sing the Traparian of the cross uh, at certain times or other pieces of uh, music, of hymnography. But it's important to know the character of this music. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So the purpose of Orthodox music is to deliver the words. That's really important. And I'll say it again. The, the purpose of Orthodox music is to deliver the words, right? The, the purpose of the music is to communicate the text. That's very different from the way we often encounter music in our culture. We might like a, a tune, but we don't really know what's being said, or we might misunderstand the lyrics. But it's very important <clears throat> that, that the, the words are chanted or sung clearly because that's the reason for the music right they, they the music delivers and and these orthodox hymns teach they teach us about salvation history and about correct doctrine so so we need to make sure we uh, have that message communicated to us we learn so much about scripture and about uh the the doctrine of the church and about salvation history about the whole life of the church by just being in the services and by paying attention and by singing or, or hearing the chanters of the choir sing, proclaiming what the apostolic faith is. And uh, to communicate, the, the rule of the church is to use the common language of the people in the land. So... In America, we're an immigrant land, so we have a lot of different languages, but, but practically, if you're in a church where people speak Arabic and Greek uh, and Russian and Chinese, uh, Japanese, Spanish, whatever, usually there's a common language, and usually that common language is English. So if you speak English, adults that speak all these other languages are any languages are still going to understand it, but also adults who only speak English and children who only speak English are going to understand it. And that's why it's the rule. Now, there are pastoral considerations. Sometimes we use a little um, Arabic and Greek and Russian and Spanish, uh, Romanian, uh, to say the Lord have mercies. And it, it uh, teaches us of the universality of the faith. And it also connects us to the... Uh, the ancient history of the faith, right? Even, even when the, the worship of the East went to the ancient West, if you look at ancient uh, Roman Orthodox worship, the, the Kyrie eleison was preserved even, even when it was uh, used in Latin, even when the liturgy was in Latin, it was Kyrie eleison, which is Greek from the East. And it really is about universality. So, uh, and and sometimes there may be someone there who doesn't speak uh, English, and uh, it's a pastoral way of connecting them to what you're doing. But the rule is English. And let me say, though, if you end up in another place in the world, or even you're in a place where uh, the, the only church doesn't really use much English, but that's the only Orthodox church that's available, you can find a book in English, or at least if you go to church all the time, you internalize the service so you can know what's being said. Um, essentially, you know what's going on, and you can certainly pray uh, even if it's in another language. So, so the service being in another language is not an excuse. But the rule really for, for us as Orthodox believers and also to, to proclaim the gospel through the world, the language is to use, uh, the rule is to use the language of the land, but with pastoral consideration. <clears throat> because it's about communicating the text. That's that's really my point. It's about communicating the text. If we don't communicate the text, then what are we doing? So also, Orthodox music is not aimed at raising the emotional state, but lifting the spiritual heart in prayer. And for Orthodox, the heart is associated with the spirit. Not It's not emotion. It's the place of of the spirit, like the the brain and the rational mind are associated, the spiritual mind, the eye of the soul, the spirit is connected, uh, associated with the heart, the physical heart. So lifting up the heart doesn't mean making me feel good. And we become, uh, even in religious contexts, often um, us, uh, we used to uh, emotional manipulation, which can be confused for spirituality. And this is, this is not the case. Now, you may find that you have an emotional response to the music, but that's not the purpose of the music. 
It is to lift up the heart in prayer. Um, what's very important for us is, is what's called dispassion. Passions are those things, unnatural movements in the soul. And dispassion is this, is this calmness. It's calming the wild beasts within us, right? Uh, that, that's what we're going for. The hymns of the church are prayers and we pray through the hymns. And so there's not like, let's do a hymn and then we do a prayer. And then we do something else. Hymn, hymnography is not something kind of like opening hymn, ending hymn, like there's separate things. The hymns of the church are the prayers that we sing through through the services. And they're often very brief because they some of them change daily. So every day of the year, there are different, different hymns in the church. And they are prayers. So we we pray when we sing, we are we are praying. <clears throat> and those words of those prayers will help us to repent from things we might not think about otherwise and, and to pray for things we may not realize we need until we find ourselves praying it uh, in the service. Orthodox singing should be peaceful uh, so that the faithful there can cultivate their inner prayer and nurturing inner silence. Inner silence is what we call Hezekiah. This is our goal. Uh, that it, Inner silence really means praying without ceasing, the heart continually in a state of prayer. Again, it's not, it's not like emotional calmness or emotional peace. This, this is something much deeper. And that's really our goal is, is uh, I mean, our goal is when our, when our rational minds are doing other things, our heart is always praying, always in a state of prayer, always in a state of communion. And we want to cultivate that. So when we're, when we're praying together uh, as a community, um, we are should be praying from the heart, and and uh, the music should not distract from that. Uh, right, it'll be teaching the mind, and 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 it will be helping us pray, but it should it should. My point is, it shouldn't be distracting for the inner prayer. So it should be it should be calm. It should be it should be peaceful, and it's otherworldly, right? So so this music really. Um, is is about giving us the sense of being in the unceasing worship of heaven. The, 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 the music like never ends, right? And we sing with our, our voices. We we don't use instruments. Uh we uh sing without instruments and, and use the most perfect instrument, uh, which is the uh, the human voice. And um it's 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 this otherworldliness, this the kingdom of heaven on earth, right? Heaven come down to earth, that is is part of what the music helps us to uh, realize the reality of, even though our hearts may be too darkened to see it. We get a sense of it in the music, and yet at the same time, Orthodox music reflects the culture of the people, right? The 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 unchanging apostolic faith is expressed through culture. And those cultures change, right? So, uh, Byzantine chant uh, is is what we sing in uh, our uh, Greek parishes or Antiochian parishes. There are different chant uh, musical traditions in uh, the Slavic context. Uh, and uh, if you've ever heard Georgian chant, uh, the Republic of Georgia, so different places in the world have taken uh, chant, really flowing from. Uh, Greek chant to produce uh, really beautiful ways of singing that are in harmony, part of the apostolic tradition, and also uh, are appropriate to those cultures. And and also choral music. Originally, Orthodox music was uh, was monophonic. So everybody would be singing the melody line. Someone may be chanting the 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 eson, which sort of helps keep everyone in the tone. But um, but now we have this beautiful choral music uh, as well, this part of uh, Orthodox worship. And, and there's something about the character of Orthodox music it, is that it's it's joyful and yet it expresses what we call the, the bright morning. Morning as in mourning for our sins, being the sorrow for our sins, our repentance. So it brings us to repentance. And and within that that repentance, though, there's no despair in repentance, right? Because we, we are turning away from our sins to be healed. It's to to experience the joy of the, the fruit of repentance. And and at once this is part of, of the music. So it's not there to keep us in this you know happy state 
all the time artificially like emotionally um it, it's it's it, I, it it really helps us to uh, see ourselves as we really are to be self-honest about who we are so that we can repent and experience that joy that's not taken away right so when you, the music stops the joy is still there so which is not the case with emotions happiness and sadness can go up and down but there's a joy that is not happiness in that in that emotional sense that's what we want it's, it's it's through the grace of god the gift of grace so uh we also will commemorate the apostle ananias of the 70 remember there were 12 apostles but there are also 70 of them that christ sent out uh the bishop of damascus he baptized the apostle paul you can read about that in the acts of the apostles he was martyred by stoning we remember him remember th these are not only people in the bible like they're historical people they're our family and we remember them our spiritual ancestors uh saint cyprian and justina uh saint justina from damascus lived a life of virginity and prayer uh, of holiness and a young man developed feelings for her so we went to the magician cyprian and wanted him to use magic so that uh, justina's heart would be turned toward him so cyprian tried and when he tried to use the power of magic to change justina he realized that her faith in Christ gave her the power, which is the power of Christ, to defeat the demons. He saw the powerlessness of the demons in the faith, in the face of her faith. He saw the fear of the demons when they saw her make the sign of the cross. And so realizing the, the powerlessness of the demons compared to Christ, uh, the one that Justina worshipped, and saw her example of purity and prayer, then he renounced magic and the demonic delusion and uh, became a Christian and was consecrated a bishop and led other pagans uh, to Christ as well. I mean, the power of example, whether it's purity um, that has continued or whether it is impurity and and repentance and then purity right the power of the example of repentance we we have an opportunity uh, and a calling to to be examples for people in the world to show them jesus christ they were both beheaded uh in 304 remember the word martyr means witness it's witnessing to the power of christ uh through their devotion to christ uh, even even unto death there's no real death in jesus christ right uh, the end of mortality, but those who are dead in Christ, or those who are dead in this life, but alive in Christ, are with Christ and awaiting his second coming and the resurrection of the body. The saints are alive and, and Christ is glorified in his saints. I also want to mention uh, that Deacon Mark Makarios, uh, who has been assigned to be the second priest, the associate pastor of the parish of St. George, uh, is going to be ordained this Sunday, October 2nd, by the hand of uh, His Grace Bishop John to be um, a priest. He's going to be ordained to the Holy Priesthood. This is a picture of him at his ordination uh, to the diaconate to become a deacon. And you can see uh, Bishop Thomas there, who um, is familiar to uh, the St. Constantine School. Uh, Deacon Mark taught Arabic at the St. Constantine School for a semester or so. And you will probably see him around uh, doing morning prayers uh, with his brother priest. So if you'd like to see his ordination, please come. So um, this is um, the Anisius the Arapagite. Uh, we commemorate on the 10th. He believed in Christ when St. Paul preached to the Areopagus in Athens. You will see this in the Acts of the Apostles. It's one of my favorite sermons. I could talk about that for a long time. Uh, and he became the first or the second bishop uh, of the church in Athens. And then we have the Holy Apostle Thomas. St. <clears throat> Thomas is commemorated also the week after Pascha, Great and Holy Pascha, which is called easter in the west after the after the resurrection we commemorate uh christ uh appearing to the apostles when thomas was there 
And uh, he's sometimes called Doubting Thomas, but he's really Believing Thomas. He confessed Christ uh, for who Christ is. Uh, so uh, we commemorate him on Thomas Sunday every year after Pascha, but uh, October 6th is also uh, a, the particular day of commemoration for the Holy Apostle Thomas. Remember Bishop Thomas in your prayer during that day. And there's Jonah of Manchuria. I wanted to mention uh, St. Jonah. He served in northern China after the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, and uh, he is now uh, counted among the saints, right? Numbered among among the saints uh, on our calendar and in our commemoration. St. John of Shanghai, uh, who's also St. John of San Francisco, uh, and, and St. John of Western Europe as well at one time. Uh, said already here in the diaspora, we have righteous ones in our time. Although they are not yet glorified, people receive wondrous signs from them. For example, Bishop Jonah of Manchuria. So this was uh, before his glorification, which in the West is, is called canonization. Right? Um, he, he was already known um, as uh, one who uh, signs... Uh, had uh, come through, right? A sign, there were signs of his sanctity, signs uh, that, what is that? That's really the grace of, of Christ, right? The power of Christ. Uh, and I should mention something, you know, about, about, about saints, right? The church makes saints in the sense that, right, the, the, the power of God, the grace of God within the church, that, that people grow in, and are purified uh, through that is what makes one a saint, a holy one, right? It's 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 the presence of 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 God within them, like shining through them, transfiguring them. So the the church doesn't make saints when we start calling someone a saint and we do services to them and make icons of them, right? They they are made a saint through their repentance, right? God makes saints, Christ makes saints. Uh, we we paint the saints on icons with with gold leaf and we put. Uh, candles in front of them, lamps in front of them, because it, it is the light of Christ uh, shining through them that makes them saints. What we do is recognize that holiness, that that the presence of Christ is within them through through miracles, through some signs um, that uh, Christ uh, is working through them and that Christ has sanctified them. And uh, that they are indeed uh, saints. And whether whether one is a saint uh, this year or was a saint uh, during the time of Christ, they are all saints. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy, the grace of the Holy Trinity that uh, sanctifies them. So the church just recognizes. We we uh, we glorify them. That's what we call it, glorification, when we recognize. Um, the church recognizes that someone is a saint, uh, is a holy one uh, in Christ. And uh, that's actually when we stop praying for them. Uh, because after you die, your repentance may be over, but the church still prays for you, right? God's outside of time. He hears prayers outside of time. Uh, so we, uh, we pray for those who are departed, but we ask for the intercessions of those who are glorified as saints and and uh, icons are made of them when this becomes official they're added to the calendar uh that that we talk about right every day we have commemorations uh services are composed for them all of these things so uh this is saint jonah of manchuria who's now glorified okay so that uh should give you an idea about some of the saints that we will uh, commemorate next week. I encourage you to learn more about them. If one of them seems interesting to you, uh, you, you can pursue learning more about uh, the life of the saint. Uh, and, and in the case of those who lived during the time of the apostles, sometimes they're written about in the Acts of the Apostles. So you can read about them in the in the scripture as well. So let as much as we can to to pray well, and uh, and to sing well, and to do that for uh, the the benefit of others, to the glory of God, and for our salvation. And the grace of the Holy Trinity be with you, and you have a great week next week.
God bless you.